Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. As the saying goes, everything is bigger in Texas. That includes an infamous murder scandal that rocked Houston beginning with the mysterious death of socialite Joan Robinson Hill in 1969. Joan was the adopted daughter of millionaire oil man Ash Robinson, and in the 1950s, she was the embodiment of beauty, wealth, and privilege. A gifted equestrian, Joan showed horses all over the United States, earning her first ribbon at age five. Her obsession with horses mirrored her father's obsession with her. There was nothing Ash Robinson wouldn't do for his little girl. Tooling around Houston in her convertible with her blonde ponytail flying, Joan was popular, boisterous, and spoiled. Her father had big dreams for her, and they did not include the men she chose to marry. After two short-lived marriages, Joan married a third time to a young doctor named John Hill. The Hills were fixtures in the Houston social scene, but their social standing covered up a largely loveless marriage. They had nothing in common and lived very separate lives. Joan fell ill suddenly in March of 1969. Her death just days later devastated her parents, particularly her father, who became convinced his son-in-law had murdered his beloved daughter. This sparked a scandal lasting years, with Ash Robinson hell-bent on avenging his daughter's death. The public trials and private machinations of this mystery and scandal captivated Houston and made national news. And the story of Joan Robinson Hill, Dr. John Hill, and the tireless vengeance of Ash Robinson spurned several books, a TV movie, and lives on in the public's continued fascination with this case. Welcome to Episode 69, The Saga of Ash Robinson, Joan Robinson Hill, and Dr. John Hill. In the state where everything is bigger, Houston casts a large shadow. Covering an area of 638 square miles, over 1,000 kilometers, it's the largest city in the U.S. by total area. Located in southeast Texas near Galveston Bay, it's also the most populated city in Texas and the fourth most populous city in the nation. With 2.3 million residents, it comes in behind New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Houston is also home to the world's largest medical center, Texas Medical Center, as well as NASA's Johnson Space Center. That would be where the Mission Control Center is located. For foreign listeners, it's what you hear in space movies, as in Houston, we have a problem. Known as the Bayou City for the 10 winding waterways in the area, as well as four major bayous, Houston has a humid subtropical climate, meaning there are two seasons, a wet season from April to October and a dry season from November to March. It's hot as hell in the summers, with temperatures rising over 100 degrees. But winters are nice, with an average of about 13 days dropping below freezing. But the Bayou City isn't Houston's only nickname. In fact, there's even a Wikipedia page dedicated just to Houston's nicknames. One of the most recent and lovely is the Big Heart, bestowed on the city after the generous resources and assistance it provided to the victims of Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana and the surrounding storm-ravaged areas. The city is named for Sam Houston, the military commander turned politician who led the battle for Texas's independence from Mexico. He was the first and third president of the Republic of Texas and later governor of Texas when it became a state. He was an honorary member of the Cherokee Nation and legendarily once beat a U.S. congressman with his cane for calling him a fraud. Houston is home to the largest livestock show and rodeo in the world, as well as the Astros in Major League Baseball, the Rockets in the NBA, and the Texans in the NFL, though the original Houston Oilers came to my fair state in 1997, becoming Tennessee's first NFL team. Incidentally, if you're a football fan, the Tennessean newspaper has a podcast called Picking Nashville about the history and politics of the Oilers becoming the Titans. Speaking of oil, the Texas oil boom in the early 20th century made a group of Houston tycoons some of the richest men in the nation. Among these tycoons was Davis Ashton Robinson, better known as Ash. He made his money quickly in the 1930s. But by 1938, Ash was accused of fraud for swindling a community west of Fort Worth. He was convicted and sentenced to seven years in the state penitentiary, though he appealed the sentence and never served a day. By 1941, he was a millionaire. It might have been this first early experience that made him feel like he was above the law. I'm going to pause now for a commercial break.
Ash Robinson originally studied dentistry at Tulane College in New Orleans before deciding to drop it as a career and venture into business for himself. He notoriously made and lost a few fortunes before he struck it rich with Texas Oil. He married Rhea Ernestine of New Orleans in 1919. But sadly, they found out Rhea could not bear children. After settling in Houston, Ash convinced Rhea to adopt a child. In March 1931, Rhea visited an orphanage called the Edna Gladney Home in Fort Worth, where she saw a beautiful one-month-old baby girl. Ash met Rhea at the train with yellow roses to welcome home his new baby girl, Joan Olive Robinson. From the day he met her, she was everything to him. In the classic true crime novel, Blood and Money, author Thomas Thompson describes an extraordinarily close relationship between father and daughter that reminded me of Rhett and Bonnie Butler from Gone with the Wind. He doted on the child. There are unsubstantiated rumors that Joan was actually Ash's real daughter, that Ash paid a woman in Houston to bear his child and arranged the adoption. She was born to a couple in a rural hospital near Eagle Lake, Texas, where Ash had grown up. Whether this is a tall tale, growing with traction after the years of this scandal is debatable and unprovable. Regardless, Ash adored his daughter. He was known to be a curmudgeon, salty even at the best of times, but not when Joan walked into the room. When Joan was three years old, she was riding in the Cadillac with her daddy when she spotted ponies at an amusement park. She begged to ride one, and thus, Joan Robinson's obsession with horses was born. She started taking riding lessons, and by age four, Ash had bought her an old nag named Dot. By five years old, she had won her first ribbon at competition, though it was for third place. Joan was sad, but Ash was pissed. His girl should have come in first. He needn't have worried. By the time Joan was in high school, she had won dozens of ribbons and trophies from horse show events across the South. Following high school, she attended Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. Her grades were average, as Joan still preferred to rush out of school and go ride her horse. According to Tommy Thompson, her overbearing parents rented a hotel suite in Columbia, where they commuted for long weekends to see Joan. She briefly showed interest in an acting career, appearing in a college production, and now making the society pages in Houston for her stunning good looks and, of course, money. An MGM talent scout spotted her and showed interest, but Ash refused to let her audition. He believed Hollywood was filled with dangerous men with designs on innocent young women. He wasn't wrong. And maybe because Joan felt so stifled through college, she rebelled when it came to marriage to Ash's horror. She first married a young Navy pilot her mother secretly approved of. The pilot was named Spike Benton, and his mother had been a Mardi Gras queen. As Rhea was from New Orleans, this endeared him to her. Ash objected to the marriage, saying they were too young and naive and wondering how Spike planned to pay for Joan's horses. In hindsight, the horse argument was fair, though his early meddling hurt Joan. She and Spike divorced within six months, and she quickly remarried to a New Orleans lawyer named Cecil Burgess, a man she had known since childhood. Again, Ash did not approve. And again, this marriage didn't make it past six months. Joan came back to Texas at age 20 to nurse her wounds and continued competing in horse shows. Ash paid $27,000 for a gray mare named Beloved Belinda, and Joan ordered a dashing new riding habit in pearl gray to match the gorgeous coat of her new horse. That would be around $250,000 in 2019 money. She won upwards of 500 trophies with beloved Belinda and later with her other show horse, Precious Possession. Legend has it, when Joan debuted beloved Belinda and her matching habit, the crowd gasped. Most riding habits were black, and Joan came out in one matching her beautiful horse. Joan would go on to win five world championships with Belinda from 1953 to 1958. Around this time, Joan started bleaching her naturally blonde hair platinum, as was all the rage in the mid-50s. She was in the society gossip pages almost every week, tied to some new hot bachelor. So Joan became one of Houston's first celebrities, basking in the attention, while deciding to give marriage a bit more thought next time. She did have a long-term boyfriend at this time named Travers Fell, a rich young heir to a land fortune who was as obsessed with horses as Joan was. But Ash hated him, too. The young man drank a lot and loved to race cars as much as horses. Joan tried in vain to rehabilitate her boyfriend's image to her father, but Travers didn't have a job. Coming from money, it's not like he really needed one, 
but Ash was offended by a man who didn't work. Sadly, the relationship with Travers fizzled out before beloved Belinda had even retired. Joan could not stand up to her father on this, and it's a shame. They sound like a real love match. She met medical student John Robert Hill at a party at the court club in early 1957. He was her age, handsome, and definitely had a good job in his future. John Hill was from a small town on the Mexican border. He had an older sister named Judy and a younger brother named Julian. His mother was very religious, and I've seen his father described as henpecked. Tommy Thompson, in the book Blood and Money, said Joan's friends, as well as Ash, referred to John as a mama's boy. And John's mother, Myra, was about as thrilled as Ash was about the match. Joan may have been a famous Houston socialite, but to Myra Hill, she was twice divorced and not suitable for her son. Myra insisted all her children get piano lessons, and John fell in love with music. Both he and his brother Julian were gifted musicians, with John playing several different instruments. He graduated with a liberal arts degree from Abilene Christian College and then attended Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Ash was more diplomatic in his resistance this time, explaining to John Hill that he had several friends who were doctors and he knew the years of residency ahead. John admitted he had about six or seven years left, though he was already a surgical resident at Houston's Herman Hospital by this time. But he also insisted to Ash Robinson that he worshiped his daughter. And maybe he did in the beginning, but the two had nothing in common. He feigned interest in horses while Joan feigned interest in music. He was formal, sensitive, and reserved, where Joan was brash, outgoing, and impetuous. However, every indication is that Joan adored her husband until her death. Despite misgivings, Ash paid for a lavish wedding, and Joan and John were married in September of 1957, when both were 26 years old. John Hill had at first considered being a cardiologist, but the city was already booming in that surgical field, but only had 10 certified plastic surgeons. So John Hill chose the practice he thought he would make more money in. According to Tommy Thompson, this is where John's ambitions lay. He wanted money. It wasn't about a passion for medicine. John Hill had come from meager means, and there is certainly nothing wrong with wanting to be rich and successful. It drives many people. But many of Joan's friends thought this is what drove John to her. Because as I said, they were the same age, but they came from distinctly different backgrounds. Joan was rich, spoiled, popular, and the toast of the town. John was not. Maybe if he hadn't wanted to be rich, he wouldn't have tried his hand at medicine, and he would have pursued a career in music, because that's where his real passion lay. For those first six years, when John was still in training, he and Joan lived with Ash and Rhea in their mansion. Naturally, this was Ash's idea. And while John wasn't happy, he knew he couldn't afford rent on his small salary and needed to wait until he had a practice to buy a home. It didn't bother Joan, though. She was used to living in her parents' home, abiding by their rules, but also enjoying the luxury that came with it. She kept showing horses and riding in competitions, retiring beloved Belinda in 1959 to much fanfare, leading her around the arena, adorned in roses, to the tune of Auld Lang Syne. She gave birth to their son, Robert Ashton Hill, in June 1960. Ash quickly nicknamed the boy Boot, and fell in love with him as much as he had his baby daughter. And so the Hills lived rather peacefully at Ash's home, with round-the-clock nannies for baby boot. John was well-liked in his residency program, but almost ruined his career by perforating a patient's bowel during a routine operation. Instead of immediately reporting what happened, he stitched the man up and sent him home. He later died of peritonitis. An autopsy uncovered the mistake, and Dr. Hill merely received a harsh reprimand. It's actually not an uncommon surgical error. It happens all the time. But closing up the patient was the problem. He tried to cover it up. But despite this incident, John Hill was scooped up for a partnership by a plastic surgeon named Nathan Roth. John joined Roth's practice in 1963. And almost immediately, he made another egregious error and tried to cover it up. While repairing a broken jaw, a drill bit broke off and became embedded in the patient's face. The patient came back in madder than hell and threatening to sue. But when the bit dropped out naturally, he dropped the suit. But Dr. Roth was angry. John said he was scared to report it because it was his first surgery under Roth. Roth was unhappy but let it slide. John's brother Julian had suddenly committed suicide right before this incident, and Roth decided to give him another chance because of the stress he had been under. 
But Roth never liked his partner or trusted him after this. John often shirked office hours and asked other surgeons to cover for him while he pursued his passion for music. He liked to perform in recitals, and instead of working the typical long hours of a doctor, he flew out the door at four o'clock sharp to rehearse every day. Roth dissolved their partnership bitterly in 1967. But in 1964, not long after he joined Roth's practice, John did buy an affordable two-story home for his family. They lived there for three years, with Ash still footing the bill, and of course paying for Joan's horses. In 1966, John found a mansion on Kirby Drive in the posh River Oak section of Houston and convinced Joan they had to buy it. They didn't need that much space, and it was ostentatious, but Joan was never much bothered by the money they spent. It was also just blocks from her parents' home, something Joan and Ash would appreciate. She talked Ash into loaning them $12,000 for the down payment of the $80,000 mansion. That would be over $630,000 today, and John certainly wasn't making that kind of money yet. On top of that, John made plans to renovate the room over the garage into a music room, complete with custom speakers built into the walls and a Bosendorfer piano. While Ash continued paying the household bills on the mansion, John sunk all his money into the music room. He had originally estimated the work to be around $20,000. It wound up coming close to $100,000 when it was finally completed. Almost three quarters of a million in 2019 money. I told you that from the beginning, John and Joan were mismatched. And though they played the role of society couple in public, things only got worse. Joan felt John was cold. He ignored her and her needs. John seemed to straight up detest his wife. He couldn't stand to be around her. She smoked, she cussed too much, and he thought she always smelled like a goat from her daily horse riding. With Ash's money, she bought a small ranch she named Chatsworth. It was about 20 minutes from their home, and she boarded horses and gave private riding lessons. But with John constantly criticizing her, and worse, freezing her out in the bedroom, Joan swore she would give up the ranch. She would give up horses altogether for him. Maybe because of his expensive music hobby, he never really took her up on it. But he still complained incessantly about her smoking and how she smelled when she got home from the ranch. For her part, Joan seemed to really love her husband and was desperate to save her marriage. She tried to quit smoking and enlisted a friend to revamp her wardrobe. For years, Joan had clung to her signature blonde ponytail and she didn't want to give that up even as the skirt styles continued to rise. She wore prim dresses with the hems that fell below the knee. She strove to look more glamorous and modern. She had always pulled off the classic style because she was so incredibly beautiful. Modernizing her wardrobe only made her more alluring, but it did little to help her failing marriage. John was threatening divorce in the summer of 1968, and Joan made a last-ditch effort to save their marriage by suggesting he accompany her to pick up their son Boot from summer camp. John never bothered with these sort of parental duties. It's not that he didn't love Boot, he just preferred to work and focus on music. After Joan's death, he and his son would become much closer. But he went on this trip with Joan, however reluctantly, and while there, met a three-time divorcee named Ann Kurth. She was there picking up her three sons from camp, and she was the polar opposite of his wife. Where Joan was blonde, cool, slim, and sleek, Anne was dark-complected, with raven hair, and lots of curves she liked to show off in skimpy outfits. John was immediately enamored with Anne, and they began a torrid and pretty much open affair. John rented a bachelor's pad close to the office, but in reality, he spent most nights at Anne's. By the end of August, John had left a note on Joan's dresser and walked out. Joan was beside herself. She wouldn't sleep or eat. She called her friends to talk for hours. She told anyone who would listen that her husband was having an affair and had left her. She took to following him around. She started scouring through his papers and was particularly stung when she found a credit card statement showing that he had purchased lizard skin shoes and a matching purse for Anne. John never bought her anything. John actually did file for divorce in the fall of 1968, and that's when Ash stepped in. He called his son-in-law and vaguely acted as though something was wrong with Boot like the child was sick or injured, to get him over to his house. Once there, Ash presented John with a handwritten letter addressed to Joan. In the fake letter, he had John apologizing and begging Joan back, with a specific portion that read, quote, 
In the event of any additional separation between us, no matter the cause or reason, I will deed you all of my interest in our home on Kirby Drive. The letter also said John would give her $1,000 a month for house expenses and immediately put $7,000 into her account. This had been a sticking point in their marriage. Despite all he spent on musical equipment and his grand music room, he gave Joan just $500 a month to run the household. She tried to cut corners and make it work, but always wound up turning to her father. It's pretty obvious what Ash was doing here. Leave my daughter and I'll ruin you financially. And it worked. John signed the letter that was written in Ash's handwriting and reluctantly went back to his wife. He withdrew the divorce petition just two days before Christmas, and then after spending an hour Christmas morning with Joan and Boot, claimed he had rounds to make at the hospital. He went to Anne's. He continued to see her, though this time being more discreet. But it was Anne who was becoming more demanding. She wanted him to leave Joan immediately. She kept claiming she wouldn't wait for him. John went to dinner for Valentine's Day at Anne's in 1969 instead of spending it with his wife. But for her part, Joan tried to go on peacefully. The ranch was constantly giving her trouble. She couldn't do everything herself and had a hard time keeping employees. She had to go to Ash for every penny and could rarely afford a good salary for them. On March 9, 1969, Joan had two house guests come to stay with her. Diane Cedagast was an old friend and Joan wanted to hire her to manage the ranch. She had what Tommy Thompson euphemistically called a companion and roommate named Eunice, and brought her along to stay with Joan and John and meet with Ash to discuss her salary. The minute they arrived, they walked in on Joan fighting with John on the phone. They knew the gossip and knew the couple had reconciled, but were shocked at the venom they heard. John came home and acted as though nothing was wrong and took the three women out to dinner. Halfway through dinner, his pager went off. He went to call the number and came back announcing he was needed at the hospital. He didn't return until 11 that night. He was still behaving very warmly to Diane and Eunice. He actually knew Diane pretty well. He had given her a breast augmentation at a discount. Now he came in and said he had brought them all pastries to enjoy. He gave each woman a specific pastry, with Joan getting a chocolate eclair. She thought his cream puff looked better and asked him to switch, but he refused, insisting she was the one who liked chocolate. After this, he got another page and left for the night. Joan was furious the next morning but he claimed that he was tired and had another surgery at 7 a.m., so he slept on the couch in the employee lounge. That night, he came home again late, and again bearing pastries. And again, Joan asked to switch. And John refused. Diane and Eunice both swore later this is what happened. The following Friday night, John and Joan went to a charity ball. John was playing the tuba with the band, and when he got back to their table, he said, let's go home. Joan protested. It was early. A friend offered to drive her home, but she said no, and told her friend discreetly that she was still trying to work things out with John, so they left. The next day was Saturday, and Joan didn't get out of the bed until almost 4 p.m. Diane and Eunice were worried about her, but John said they had quarreled after the charity ball and Joan was upset, so he had given her a tranquilizer so she would sleep. The women were bewildered. It had been an awful week watching this couple fight. Joan eventually got up and apologized. She said that John had given her something to help her sleep. That evening, she was pissed at John again. He had taken Boot for a haircut, but had been gone for hours. The little boy admitted to her that he went to his father's apartment. Joan and the other two women, along with her best friend named Van, started a game of bridge, while Joan played his music extremely loud. Apparently, Joan kept shouting over the music, complaining about her husband. She practically yelled that she was going to a lawyer on Monday. Her friend Van finally broke the tension, suggesting the couple dance. And according to the women, they did, romantically. It was all so odd. Diane and Eunice later claimed that as they went to bed, they passed the open door of the Hill's bedroom and saw John giving Joan an injection. He looked up and said, she's not feeling well. The next morning, Ash called from the airport asking for Joan to come and get him. Diane answered the phone and said Joan wasn't feeling well. It seemed like a touch of the flu. Joan came down to see her dad when he came in and immediately got sick. She ran from the room vomiting. She went back to bed and stayed there most of that Sunday. She came downstairs that afternoon saying she was queasy. John felt her forehead and said it was probably a virus, but that he felt a bit queasy too. 
Maybe it was something they ate at the charity ball. She went back to bed, and John took the other two women out for Mexican food. On Monday, March 17th, Diane and Eunice were leaving and went to Joan's room to say goodbye. Joan told them she felt dehydrated, and they brought her water, concerned and not wanting to leave her. But she said she was okay. Her housemate Effie was there and would take care of her. Effie would later say that John Hill specifically told her not to disturb Mrs. Hill. She needed her rest. By mid-afternoon, she had been answering the phone nonstop and was worried that she hadn't heard a peep from Joan. Effie went and looked in on Joan, who she said looked awful and spoke very weakly. She said, Effie, I'm so sick. Effie was really worried, but said, Dr. Hill will be home soon. The next morning, Tuesday, March 18th, Effie was preparing breakfast when John called her to their bedroom. She later said he was holding Joan's head in his arms and told her to come in and clean up the mess. Joan had soiled the bed in her sleep. He then told her to make sure that Joan took the medicine he left on the bedside table. And then he left. Effie was horrified when she went to clean up Joan. She was lying on two white towels that were soaked through. Underneath, there was diarrhea, and some of it was dried, so she knew Joan had lain there all night. She helped Joan get up and go to the bathroom, and Joan said she was burning up. Effie had to practically carry her, and then Joan lost her bowels again before she got to the toilet. She was cold and turning blue, and Effie said she cried, I don't want to die. Effie said she promised her she wouldn't and said, let's pray together. She got Joan and the bed cleaned up and tucked her back in and then rushed to call Dr. Hill at his office. He showed up about an hour later. Around 10.30 that morning, Rhea came to bring Boot home and check on Joan. They found John at her bedside, and he said, we better take her to the hospital. Rhea asked if an ambulance was coming, and John said no, they were driving her. He said they were taking her to Sharpstown Hospital. They had an intensive care unit, and as he performed surgeries there, Joan would be treated like a queen. But this hospital was 45 minutes away. There was a much better hospital just 10 minutes away. Effie Green later said that John made Joan walk down the stairs herself. She went to help her, and John said no, she can walk by herself. They got Joan bundled up in the backseat of her Cadillac, and Rhea got in beside her right as Ash pulled up, demanding to know how Joan had gotten so sick. Rhea said her daughter said, Mother, I'm blind. I can't see you. To which John said, She's having a blackout. When they pulled up to the hospital, they put Joan in a wheelchair and took her in. Then Rhea Robinson found out there was no emergency room, much less an intensive care unit. Her daughter was wheeled into a private room where nurses quickly took over. She was anxious, but trusted her son-in-law, the doctor. But John had disappeared. Turns out he had a surgery scheduled at Sharpstown for 11.30 that morning. He would later say he just didn't realize how sick his wife was and that he chose the hospital because of his surgery and so that Joan could have a private room. John had already called a friend of his, Dr. Walter Burtnott, to come and take care of his wife. Burtnott did practice internal medicine, but he had never been Joan's doctor and had only met her twice. He found it unusual that he was called in, but didn't argue. When John called, Burtnott asked Joan's symptoms, and when he said vomiting, diarrhea, and nausea, Burtnott wasn't worried. He figured it was a stomach flu. He was flattered to be asked to treat the famous Joan Robinson Hill, but still didn't really know why John called him. He said John didn't act as though it was an urgent matter either. Before Burtnott could even get to the hospital, The nurses had taken Joan's blood pressure and found it was 60 over 40. They checked it again, thinking the blood pressure cuff was malfunctioning, before placing an emergency call to Burton Knott, who was in an adjacent building, not aware of how dangerous the situation was. He came immediately. He was surprised to find Joan sitting up in the bed, and she called him by his first name. He started IV fluids and ordered blood, urine, and stool cultures. He thought she had to be in deep shock, but she was so alert it was strange. He now assumed it was food poisoning. But by late afternoon, Joan's kidneys were shutting down. And by 8 p.m., he called in another doctor, a well-respected renal specialist, who confirmed Joan was in serious kidney failure. Burtnott asked if they should move her to Houston Methodist, a hospital better equipped for life-threatening emergencies. But the renal doctor said no, she was too sick to be moved. He ordered peritoneal dialysis, basically forcing fluids into the peritoneal cavity to act as a kidney. 
but he couldn't actually begin the procedure without John's approval, her next of kin. He called him at 9.15 p.m., but John didn't show up until 11 o'clock to give approval for the procedure. Both doctors and another attending felt that Joan was somewhat stabilized. She wasn't out of the woods, but her blood pressure did raise some. The other doctors heard Joan beg her husband to stay with her, telling him she was so afraid. He sat down beside her, and two of the doctors went home for the night with one staying on duty. Once Joan was more easy and heavily sedated, John said he would go sleep on the couch in the lounge for the night. The other doctor also left around 1.30 a.m., leaving Joan in the care of nurses and a young resident. About an hour later, one of the nurses came running frantically for John, while another called the nursing station to bring cardiac arrest equipment. Joan was coding. The nurses later said that Joan tried to gasp John's name, and then she raised up and spewed a torrent of blood out of her mouth. The resident on call raced in and gave her a shot of adrenaline to the heart, but it was too late. Joan Robinson Hill died in agony, vomiting a horrific hemorrhage. She was 38 years old. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from our sponsors. Because Joan died within 24 hours of being admitted to a hospital, an autopsy would be automatic per protocol. The doctors all met with John before dawn that morning, and Bert Knott told him that she had to have an autopsy. He later said John said, yes, of course, but after Bert Knott left the room, he called the funeral home to pick up Joan's body and prepare her for burial. The pathologist called in for autopsy wasn't told of the urgency, but got up and went to the funeral home around 10 a.m. It wasn't unusual for an autopsy to be performed in a funeral home, so he didn't think much of it. But when he got there, Joan's body had already been embalmed. Her blood and other vital fluids were lost forever. He stopped everything and began an autopsy anyway. The best he could do was just look and then take sections of her organs for analysis. Although Joan had been so ill, John and Rhea Robinson had gone home that night, satisfied that their daughter was in good hands. It wasn't until after Joan was dead that they realized how wrong it had been to take her to Sharpstown Hospital. By midday, news of Joan's death had spread across Houston, and friends and family gathered at Ash's home, not John's. John was asleep in an upstairs bedroom. Ash was frozen with grief and Rhea had been given whiskey and a sedative. The funeral home kept calling, asking about clothing and other items needed for Joan's funeral. Finally, a friend of Joan's named Yvonne went to her closet and chose a glittery gold evening gown for her friend to be buried in. She then took it to the funeral home and was so distressed at the sight of Joan's swollen, waxy body. She called John for his approval of the dress and asked if he wanted to bring Joan's wedding ring or any other jewelry. She had noticed that her swollen hands were bare. John said no, the dress was ornate enough. By that evening, pathologist Dr. Morse declared the cause of death to be probable pancreatitis. Without blood tests, he didn't have much to go on and only noted the inflammation of major organs. The pancreas is a digestive gland. It is small but vital for digestion and manufactures insulin. If it becomes infected, the inflammation can spread quickly and cause death, but it's usually seen in much older patients. By Thursday morning, Diane Cedagast and Eunice returned for Joan's funeral, scheduled for the following day. They went to the Hill home, not the Robinsons, and Diane was angry to find John entertaining in his music room, showing a Laurel and Hardy comedy on a movie screen. By that evening, she was having a serious conversation with Ash Robinson, presumably about everything she had seen when she stayed with John and Joan as Joan had gotten sick. Friday morning at 9 a.m., Ash was at the Harris County Assistant District Attorney's Office. Assistant DA I.D. McMaster met with the old man, who insisted he go and stop Joan's funeral. He was skeptical at first until Ash gave him a rundown of the timeline of Joan's illness and of what Diane and Eunice had seen John give to his wife. Aside from the pastries, they knew he had administered at least one shot to Joan and given her a pill. Ash wanted the county coroner to do another autopsy. He was convinced John Hill had murdered his daughter. He called Harris County Coroner Joseph Yakimzik to go to the funeral. He peered at Joan's body in the casket, but did not disturb her or interrupt the funeral. Joan Robinson Hill's funeral was massive, with over 200 floral arrangements. 
Ash was told there wasn't a rose to be had in Houston or New Orleans. According to author Thomas Thompson, at Jones' burial, Ash was overheard saying, quote, If the law doesn't get that son of a bitch, I will. You might remember that coroner for my episode on the murder of Cheryl Ferguson. The man I believe was either corrupt or so incompetent that he supposedly threw out the swabs from Cheryl's rape kit and then made outrageous speculations on the stand in order to support the prosecution of an innocent black man. In Joan's case, however, he did not bow to the venerable Ash Robinson. He attributed her death to acute focal hepatitis. He based this decision on blood culture taken at the hospital when Joan was admitted. It was negative for bacterial infection and for poisonous substances like arsenic or strychnine. But Ash found several high-profile doctors who disagreed with Yakimsik. They argued that Joan would not have been seen healthy and dancing on a Friday night and then dead by the following Tuesday from hepatitis. In the meantime, Ash hired a private detective who was collecting written statements from Diane and Eunice as well as Effie Green, the housemaid for the Hills. Only Effie's statement was strange. It switched points of view several times and claimed in harsh words that she had seen Joan Hill murdered before her very eyes. It would turn out that Ash wrote this statement himself. He also asked John Hill to approve of having Joan's body exhumed. He wanted a second autopsy. John refused, saying he didn't want her grave disturbed. A little over two months later, Dr. John Hill married his mistress, Ann Kurth. If Ash was angry before, this was the last straw. He openly accused John Hill of murder. He wrote letters to the medical board saying John was unfit. He constantly talked to the press, and he talked to numerous other doctors and hired more investigators. He again pressured Assistant DA McMaster to charge John Hill with murder. McMaster knew he had no evidence to support a murder charge, but he finally agreed to call a grand jury to decide. John was urged to take a polygraph test to put the matter to rest. I don't believe at this point it would have stopped Ash Robinson's quest, and John refused. He also refused to testify before the grand jury. But oddly, he agreed to take a sodium pentothal injection and to be questioned, otherwise known as truth serum. John technically passed the test, usually only seen in old spy movies. But witnesses later said he seemed to be alert. And his new wife, Ann Kurth, would later say that he gave himself an injection before the test, a drug to counteract the truth serum. For the record, I've never researched another case involving truth serum, and this case will only get more bizarre. John's life with Anne had at first been blissful. He was an idiot to marry her so soon after Joan's death, whether he was actually guilty of her murder or not. But both John and Anne later said that the happiness was short-lived. John claimed Anne was extremely jealous of Joan. She said he was moody and was dismayed to find he was deeply in debt, and the publicity surrounding Joan's death was hurting his practice. The year after Joan died, he made less than a third of what he had the year before. The grand jury ended its term at the end of the summer of 1969 without bringing charges against John Hill. Ash called the jury foreman, who he knew, and had actually met with while proceedings were still being conducted, demanding an explanation. Despite the man's friendship, he told Ash that there was no evidence to indict his former son-in-law. Quote, We were not asked to return an indictment of adultery. But Ash would not let it go. He sought out the most renowned pathologist in the United States, Dr. Milton Halpern. He worked with the Harris County coroner, the good Dr. Joseph Yakimzik, to get Joan's records to the famed pathologist, who was the chief medical examiner of New York City. According to author Tommy Thompson, Yakimzik later told a friend that Ash paid the coroner six figures. But Ash had to get the body exhumed first. The only way Dr. Halpern would agree to do a second autopsy was if he was officially invited by Harris County. So Ash put pressure on the district attorney, Carol Vance, going over the assistant DA's head. DA Vance was weary of the case, but also realized how high profile it was. Ash Robinson had many friends in high places, and he would never let this drop. So Vance ordered a second grand jury to authorize the exhumation of Joan's body. Ash wrote an impassioned letter to the grand jury, strategically using letterhead from Chatsworth Farm, with a beautiful picture of Joan at the top, smiling on one of her horses. This grand jury was now curious enough to order the exhumation. On August 16, 1969, the body of Joan Robinson Hill was exhumed. The first thing Dr. Halpern saw was dried mud on the inside of the casket. It had already been opened. When confronted, 
John Hill admitted that he had gotten a permit to exhume Joan's body just three days after her burial to remove a ring from her finger, even though he had insisted his wife be buried without her wedding rings. It was lost on no one that as a doctor, John Hill would have known that opening a sealed coffin and exposing the body to air would speed up decomposition. Dr. Helpern took careful samples of Joan's organs, again for analysis, and then he returned to New York to run tests and write a formal report for the grand jury. He had also specifically looked for needle marks, any indication that Joan may have been poisoned. He only found the marks from the IV placed at the hospital. However, he did find that both Joan's heart and brain were missing. The original pathologist, Dr. Morse, was called to the autopsy and defensively said he had removed them for further testing and had not had time to place them back in Joan's coffin before burial. And embarrassingly, he now could not find the heart in his specimens. But hold on, y'all. He had the brain of Joan Robinson Hill in the trunk of his car. He brought it in and presented it to Dr. Helpern, who took sections from the brain as well as Joan's spinal cord to check for meningitis. The symptoms of meningitis were similar to what the original doctor had thought was a stomach flu, and bacterial meningitis can be fatal within a matter of days. After Dr. Helpern went back to New York, he wasn't heard from for months. Meanwhile, the honeymoon was over for John and Anne by October of 1969, just four months after they married. John wanted to file for divorce, and his attorney, Richard Haynes, advised against it. Ironically, the lawyer's nickname was Racehorse. He was a famed criminal defense attorney in Houston. He is referred to in newspapers, books, and the eventual movie as Racehorse Haynes throughout the rest of John's legal ordeals. John couldn't see why he shouldn't file for divorce. Racehorse later said he was a typical unemotional doctor. He just didn't get it but he listened to his lawyer for the time being. As they waited for Dr. Helpern's report, Harris County Coroner Dr. Yakimzik released yet another opinion on Jones' cause of death. Tommy Thompson posited that the county coroner was embarrassed and jealous that Ash brought in the famed New York pathologist to go over his work. I can see that. After his disastrous involvement in the Cheryl Ferguson case, my eye twitched when I saw his name connected to this one. Yakimzik now said that Joan had died from a fulminating infectious process of an unspecific nature. So in other words, an infection of unknown origin. Without blood tests, neither he nor any other coroner could prove whether the infection was viral, bacterial, or toxicological. But he insisted that due to the unusual circumstances around Joan's death, the matter should go before a grand jury. Still waiting for Helpern's report, John Hill was still adamant he wanted to divorce Anne. He told Racehorse Haynes that she had a violent temper and described in a sworn deposition how she took all photographs and mementos of Joan left in the house and burned them in a fit of rage in the backyard. Anne would later claim it was John who did this. Reluctantly, Racehorse filed the papers, which started what he referred to as the war on Kirby Drive. Because naturally, Anne went straight to Ash Robinson. In February of 1970, a third grand jury was convened to consider the death of Joan Robinson Hill. On this panel was a dear friend of hers. He had been a pallbearer at her funeral. This was highly improper. John Hill was alarmed, but Racehorse told him not to worry. Two grand juries had failed to indict him, and he still didn't believe the DA had any new evidence. Dr. Helpern's report was still not in, but Racehorse did demand a public hearing. Actually, he asked for one and was denied, so he leaked it to a newspaper. But the DA wouldn't budge. So now Racehorse Haynes filed a $10 million lawsuit against Ash Robinson for slander, for trying to influence a grand jury to indict, and for grave financial harm, all of which was true. They hoped that Ash would drop the pressure on the DA if they agreed to drop the civil suit against him. They were sadly mistaken. Ash Robinson was not only a millionaire, he was hell-bent on seeing this through. The lawsuit didn't scare him. And John Hill's divorce from Anne was final on March 12, 1970, just in time for her to testify before the grand jury. If this also sounds highly improper, that's because it is. It's a basic tenet of law that a wife cannot testify against her husband, even after divorce, if what she would divulge was discovered while they were married. Anne had testified on her husband's behalf in the previous grand juries, and was allowed to now. Even a jury member asked if it would be admissible at trial. Assistant D.A. McMaster reportedly admitted that he honestly didn't know. And finally, Dr. Helpern was called to testify, 
though he sheepishly admitted he wasn't done writing his report. He agreed to come and read what was completed and then finish the report orally, instead of continuing to make the grand jury wait for his findings. And his report basically exonerated John Hill, disputing every possible rumor of poison and insisting that while Joan's body had already been exhumed, her body had not actually been disturbed. And then he went sideways in front of the grand jury. He began speculating on what could have happened to Joan. He brought up the supposedly sworn depositions by Diane, Eunice, and Effie. Most egregious was mentioning Effie Green, whose report was admittedly typed up by Ash Robinson. At least, Diane and Eunice had written their own depositions out in longhand. He basically left the grand jury with the impression that John Hill coldly gave his wife a mysterious shot and then left her to die in her own excrement. He even brought up the affair with Ann Kurth. When pressed for an actual cause of death, he said it was, quote, acute inflammation of some sort. No shit, Dr. Helburn. But a juror asked a question that would turn everything around. Was Joan Hill's treatment at home by her husband satisfactory? Helburn even wrote his answer in his final report submitted days after the grand jury. Quote, Failure to provide medical attention at home and resultant delay in hospitalization for diagnosis and effective therapy aggravated a situation which proved fatal. He had just opened the door on an obscure charge rarely used called murder by omission. I'm not sure old racehorse saw this coming, and it had obviously never occurred to the DA or his assistant to pursue this charge before this last hearing. Helburn's report was not universally received well in the medical community of Houston. Incredibly, the only trained pathologist Ash Robinson had hired before Helburn wrote a blistering letter of opposition to the grand jury. Aside from the lack of evidence, he had given his own opinion to Ash that Joan had died from shock after sepsis. She had, quote, mild gastroenteritis, which developed into esophagitis, which then caused sepsis. Basically, she had some sort of stomach flu that had somehow turned into blood poisoning. He further pointed out that physicians are, quote, notorious for ignoring the aches and pains of their families, and also that Dr. Hill was a plastic surgeon, not an internist, meaning he was not as familiar with the fatal signs of sepsis shock. But the grand jury was not impressed. They were entranced by the theatrics and drama of the case, especially after watching Anne and then John testify. He did eventually take the stand, and he did not come off well. He had difficulty repressing facial expressions of aggravation, and he sounded too clinical during his testimony. This time, the grand jury indicted him for intentionally and culpably failing and omitting to administer proper medical treatment to his wife. John Hill was finally brought to trial in February of 1971. By then, he had met another woman named Connie Loesby. If Travers Fell had been Joan's true match, then Connie Loesby was John's. She was also a musician who had even sang soprano in several opera workshops in Philadelphia. After touring Europe with another company, she landed at a junior college in Texas. She met John Hill at a musical performance at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, where she played the harpsichord and sang. It was basically love at first sight. But this time, John wised up and did not remarry his third wife before going on trial for the murder of his first wife. John's trial was a magnificent bit of courtroom drama. Suffice it to say, everyone who gave depositions testified, including Diane, Eunice, and Effie Green. But obviously, there was only one star witness. Mrs. Ann Kurth Hill. As I said before, it is a basic tenet of law that spouses cannot testify against each other. Racehorse Haynes argued heatedly against her testimony, insisting the principle went back to ancient times. He wasn't wrong, but the prosecution found a way around it. If the husband had admitted to his wife his crime while in the process of committing the same crime, she could testify against him. They had unearthed another obscure precedent. All they needed now was for Ann to play her part. But she couldn't actually say anything John had said to her. She just had to tell a similar story of how he had tried to kill her. And she did, with relish. Vamped up in a miniskirt and huge teased hair, she took the stand. She needed to tell the court that John had tried to kill her. So she spun a story about a car accident she and John had on the night of June 30th, 1969. She and her then-husband were driving around Houston and past Chatsworth Farm, Joan's old ranch. She claimed John said, quote, There's where someone lived who doesn't anymore, and now neither are you. 
And then she said he deliberately rammed their car into the side of a bridge on her side. She claimed she only survived because she never wore her seatbelt and jumped over to John's side, receiving only a minor cut to her knee. And this was verifiable. There was an accident. John's side of the story was that it was an accident, but one caused by Anne. They were arguing, and she tried to grab the wheel. But now his ex-wife took the stand and said that he purposely rammed the car against the bridge on her side, trying to kill her. And then she claimed when that didn't work and they were still barreling down the road, John Hill reached into his pocket and pulled out a syringe and tried to inject her. And this would have been enough. As preposterous as it was, it was allowed. But Assistant DA McMaster could not help but ask a leading question. Did you know if he was attempting to treat you or harm you, he asked. When she replied yes, he said, by something that occurred before this, immediately before this? Anne said yes, and then quickly exclaimed, quote, he told me how he had killed Joan with a needle. And at that, she was cut off by Racehorse Haynes' thunderous objection and demand for a mistrial. He had already gotten into the record several objections and exceptions to Anne's testimony, at the very least, hoping to salvage something on appeal. But now they had played into his hands. She could not say what John said to her, only what he did to her. The judge overruled his objection, but called a recess. When he came back, he had changed his mind and abruptly ruled for mistrial. Honestly, reading back over all of this, I don't know why McMaster would risk it, except for the fact that they had already gotten so much farther than they should have in just getting John Hill to trial, and they were able to get Anne on the stand to boot. I think he got cocky and thought the judge would allow it. But the judge had watched this entire melodrama play out in his courtroom, and while he had allowed many things a lot of judges wouldn't, At this point, he probably knew he would be overturned on appeal and possibly sanctioned for his terrible rulings. Incidentally, he was also an old friend of Ash's. You would think John Hill would have been happy about the mistrial, but he wasn't. He wanted his name cleared for good. The jury was polled later and were almost unanimous to acquit John. Of course, Ash was furious. He had spent so much time and money to get John to trial, and he wanted justice. The prosecution knew they would never get as far as they had in the first trial again. Public opinion was beginning to swing in John's favor. The city of Houston had watched with great interest as Ash Robinson desperately tried to manipulate the justice system, and John was rehabilitating his image within the medical community and the Houston social scene. He married Connie just four months after the mistrial. She was a huge asset in repairing his image. Unlike Anne, she was a demure lady. Their shared interest in music was now a big part of John's life whereas his first two wives had merely tolerated it. In late September of 1972, John and Connie flew to Las Vegas for a plastic surgery convention. Myra Hill, John's mother, stayed with Boot, who was now called by his proper name Robert. The boy no longer saw his grandfather, and as soon as his mother died, John stopped that nickname. Myra got a few phone calls for Dr. John Hill. She didn't think anything of it. She was polite and told the caller each time that Dr. Hill was out. One caller called twice. The second time, she helpfully told him exactly when Dr. Hill was due to arrive home from Vegas on the evening of September 24th, 1972. Myra and her grandson eagerly awaited the couple's arrival. Robert had grown very close to his new stepmother, now referring to her as Mama. When the doorbell rang, young Robert ran to open the door with Myra trailing behind. A strange man pushed his way into the house. He had a long floppy mustache and some sort of green hood on his head and he was holding a gun. Trying to remain calm, Myra asked if he was a patient of Dr. Hill's, thinking he might be mentally unstable and she could calm him down. He said, no ma'am, this is a robbery. He pulled out a roll of duct tape and bound Myra and Robert's hands and feet. He also gagged Myra and Robert, though Robert had reportedly licked his lips beforehand, a trick he had seen in a movie. When John and Connie rang the doorbell, both Myra and Robert started screaming. Robert had gotten his gag off, but Myra was trying to scream through hers. The man kicked Myra viciously in the throat and Robert in the ear to make them shut up. He jerked the door open and surprised Connie, who had been making funny faces through the glass, thinking Robert was answering. He grabbed her by her blouse, yanking a gold necklace in the process. She screamed and managed to jump sideways off the porch, running to a neighbor's house. John Hill did not run. He pushed the man, struggling with the gun. John Hill's assassin later gave a full confession of what happened next. He said he hit John across the face, knocking him to the ground, and as John tried to rise, he shot him three times. Then he kept hitting him across the face before he completely duct-taped John's face. 
He covered his eyes, nose, and mouth. If John didn't die from the gunshot wounds, he would suffocate, dying a horrific death. And then he ran away. Robert had spit off his gag and ran to the kitchen phone, managing to call the police. Connie had also sounded the alarm, and when the neighbors she went to came running in the house, they could already hear the sirens. The neighbor found 12-year-old Robert Boot Hill hopping up and down with his legs still taped, sobbing, They've killed my daddy. John was lying in a pool of blood, sprawled into the foyer, halfway down a step leading into the living room. The first ambulance attendant rolled him over and knew right away he was dead. Blood was oozing from the duct tape on John's face, and there was no pulse. It was too late. He was shot in his left shoulder, his right wrist, and finally on the right side of his abdomen, piercing his diaphragm, stomach, and aorta. He bled out internally very quickly. Everyone in Houston knew that this was no burglary and that Ash Robinson had a hand in it. Though they had declined to investigate Joan's death, Houston detectives were immediately required on scene for John's violent murder. They quickly found where the gun had been ditched and traced it back to a doctor from Longview, Texas. When they went and questioned the doctor, he told them, quote, a whore stole it. He only knew her by her street name of Dusty. Dusty turned out to be a woman named Marcia McKittrick, a woman well-known to law enforcement all over Texas. She was known as a spot girl, meaning she traveled to different spots to meet Johns. It was a rather elite group of sex workers who often evaded law enforcement because they stayed on the move. But Marcia had been arrested the year before in Houston. As the police searched for Marcia, an informant gave them a tip. She had a new so-called alliance, a man from Dallas named Bobby Wayne Vandiver. Police caught Vandiver first, who almost immediately confessed and implicated Marcia and another woman named Lila Paulus. Lila was the one who had set up the murder. He did not know who her contact was. She just referred to him as the old man. He was paid $5,000 for the hit on John Hill, and he promptly handed Lila $1,500 back as a finder's fee when she paid him. Marcia proved much harder to catch, but when she was caught, she was the first to implicate Ash Robinson. She knew his name. She had actually met him several times, and she was the one who introduced Bobby Vandiver to Lila Paulus. Harris County secured three secret indictments against the co-conspirators, still trying to catch Ash Robinson. Lila made bail, and incredibly, so did Bobby Vandiver. Despite the seriousness of his first-degree murder charge, he was allowed to walk free. It was more important to the prosecution to keep him in their pocket to testify at the coming trials, because Lila Paulus was denying everything. Bobby Vandiver had to tie her to the hit, and he knew enough about his victim to know that he was a doctor whose wife had died mysteriously and that her father wanted him dead. Anyone in Texas would know who that was. But with only one accomplice positively implicating Ash, Ash Robinson was not indicted. Lila's trial was scheduled first. Marcia took a plea deal in exchange for her testimony. But before the trial started, Bobby Vandiver was in the wind. He knew he was spending the rest of his life in prison and he decided to run rather than cooperate. This is why Bell is incredible to me. He was caught in Longview, playing pool in a cafe. As an officer approached him, he pulled out a thirty-eight revolver. So the officer pulled out his gun and shot Bobby Van Diver dead. Now the hitman, the connecting thread between Lila and Marcia, was gone. The case against Ash Robinson was in shambles. Lila went to trial and denied setting up the murder. She claimed she only knew of Ash Robinson though her own daughter showed up to testify against her. Her daughter claimed they knew the Robinsons well. She'd even taken writing lessons from Joan Robinson Hill. She also accused her mother of pimping her out at a young age. She ran away from home at 17, and they had been estranged ever since. Her testimony was incredibly damaging to Lila, and you would think to Ash, but it wasn't direct evidence of his involvement. She could only say that her mother knew the man. Marcia's testimony was stronger. She implicated Ash Robinson in court, explaining how he knew Lila and how she connected Lila with her friend Bobby, who agreed to carry out the hit. Even one of Joan's old friends came to testify against Lila and insisted she and Ash Robinson knew each other. But despite all of this testimony connecting Lila and Ash Robinson, it was only hearsay. There was no proof. The closest thing investigators had to tangible circumstantial evidence was that Ash Robinson ordered a private phone line in the weeks before John's death and had it disconnected shortly after. When Lila was arrested, a slip of paper was found in her purse with that number on it. But that still wasn't enough. The DA was worried about how the search and seizure was carried out with Lila. 
supposedly. I personally think the DA's office was now done. They were weary of Ash Robinson, a man who had successfully manipulated the system to convene three grand juries and finally a murder trial against his son-in-law with no actual proof other than suspicious circumstances. Ash Robinson was an old man, but a wealthy man. He would fight them until he died, just as he had fought to bring John Hill to justice before taking it into his own hands. Lila Paulus was convicted and sentenced to 35 years in the penitentiary. She died while still in prison in 1986 of breast cancer. Marcia McKittrick's deal had been for 15 years, and she was paroled early for good behavior. I did see on a gossip board about this case that she landed in Nashville some years later and was arrested for prostitution. I couldn't find official record of that, but I did find that she passed away in Mesquite, Texas in 2010. After John Hill's murder, Ash and Rhea Robinson retired to Pensacola, Florida. Ash passed away in 1985 at the age of 87, with Rhea following him less than two years later. Before that, in August of 1977, when Robert was 17, he and Connie Lois B. Hill, along with Myra Hill, filed a wrongful death suit for $7.6 million against Ash Robinson for orchestrating John Hill's murder. However, the case was eventually thrown out, and by 1981, Robert had reconciled with his grandparents. He made the papers when he put his parents' Kirby Drive mansion up for sale, saying, quote, Mother could no longer take care of the place, referring to Connie, his stepmother. And she was set to remarry an old man named Jim Calloway, and Robert was in college in Colorado. After Ash's death, Robert told a reporter from the Pensacola News Journal, quote, My father didn't kill my mother. I'd bet my life on it. That's what Ash may have thought, but he was wrong. Robert Boot Hill moved on with his life after the death of his parents and grandparents. He is now a practicing attorney in the state of Maryland and refuses any requests for interviews, understandably. Ann Kurth wrote a book called Prescription Murder. It is particularly salacious, with much rumor and speculation, and is held in little regard to the facts of the death of Joan Robinson Hill, probably because she repeated her wild story of how John Hill tried to kill her, embellishing it with gruesome detail of how he supposedly confessed to her that he had injected his wife with feces and other bacteria to kill her. She also insisted John Hill was still alive, that he staged his death and began a new life in Mexico. She went to her deathbed in 1990, claiming that she still got strange calls from her ex-husband, playing a Rachmaninoff song that they had loved. The soapy melodrama of Kurth's ridiculous book was turned into a highly entertaining TV movie called Murder in Texas, starring Farrah Fawcett as Joan, Sam Elliott as John, and Andy Griffith as Ash Robinson, for which he was nominated for an Emmy. I could only find the movie on YouTube, though I did see you could purchase a VHS copy from Amazon. It came out in 1981 and is a good example of how much fun soapy, scandalous, supposedly based on true story movies were back then. But if anyone ever decides to make another movie about this southern gothic melodrama, I hope they use Thomas Thompson's book, Blood and Money. He had deals on the table not long after its publication in 1976, but several lawsuits were filed against him by Ash Robinson and others, including Ann Kurth, who sued for three million, unhappy about how he described her as a, quote, provocatively dressed, heavily made up woman. The court agreed the comments were derogatory, but dismissed the case anyway. Thompson settled out of court with Ash Robinson, who had been allowed to read the book beforehand and had approved, but then changed his mind. Tommy Thompson passed away in 1982 before he could get another movie deal for Blood and Money. And what can we make of this huge saga today? I do believe Ash Robinson set up John Hill's murder. There appears to be little doubt to his guilt, though Harris County declined to prosecute him. As for John Hill's guilt in the death of Joan Robinson Hill, I honestly cannot make up my mind. Despite the compelling testimony of Diane and Eunice, I do believe he may have simply been trying to be friendly in bringing pastries home for the women. I think he was playing the good host so he could keep answering his pager and slipping out to see his mistress. And I did find what many doctors later said about Joan's death and John's possible involvement to be compelling as well. It is very possible he did not realize just how sick she was. He was not an internist, but as a doctor, he was egotistical enough to think he could handle it and treat her himself. But he did behave coldly and made terrible decisions on the last day of her life. No matter how you look at it, I do believe a case of criminally negligent homicide could have been made. And he was awaiting a second murder trial 
with the charge of murder by omission when he was assassinated, which is different because that charge assigns malice and deliberation. I'm not sure they ever could have proven that. And the mystery of Joan Robinson Hill's death will never really be solved. In 1980, doctors began speculating that she could have suffered from toxic shock syndrome. The same doctor who wrote the letter to the grand jury defending John Hill believed this because he found in his autopsy that Joan was in the menstrual portion of her cycle or had just ceased it. And a close friend of Joan's confirmed that she regularly used tampons. And her symptoms match. But the diagnosis and phrase toxic shock syndrome was not used until 1978. No one had even heard of it when Joan died in 1969. Whatever caused the death of the beautiful socialite will never really be known. But the story of how a father bought and paid for justice, Texas style, for his beloved daughter will never get old. Revenge is a tale as old as time. And Ash Robinson is the embodiment of wealth, power, obsession, and wrath. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. To any listeners in the Houston area, I want you to know I'm thinking of you and praying that everyone makes it through the flooding safely. I mentioned Thomas Thompson's book, Blood and Money, several times, and I cannot recommend it enough. It is extremely cinematic. And I can't help but also recommend the TV movie based on Anne Kurth's ridiculous book. It is a fun way to pass a lazy afternoon. And you can go down a thousand internet rabbit holes about the mysterious death of Joan Robinson Hill. The juicy gossip boards alone are worth your time. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I won't be answering any more private messages on social media. Too many get lost, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So email is best, and please feel free to reach out. I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.